Today, I'm going to bring to you one of my favorite software. Uh, it is the Sky Safari software. And in fact, this is a software that is very similar to the Starry Night software that I've been using on our channel for a very long time. And the folks over at Simulation Curriculum, um, they are a sponsor of this channel. So I want to put that out there right away um, that uh, this is a, a cooperation between myself and Simulation Curriculum, the makers of Sky Safari. So it's not necessarily a review of this, but it is, in fact, uh, my personal beliefs. I really do believe in this software. And I think it's the best planetarium software on the market right now for people who are beginners to astronomy, as well as all the way up um, to the most advanced people as well. I myself have been doing um, astronomy for over 15 years. I'm a planetarium director and teacher and professor of astronomy. So I've got background in this uh, professionally, and I continue to learn things every day when I use Sky Safari. Um, so I think you'll really enjoy it. So I'm going to be putting uh, the tablet here uh, to the test. This is an Android tablet. Um, I have not used Android in about a year or so, maybe a little longer. I've been an Apple uh, convert um, previous. Prior to that, I should say, uh, I had been doing a lot of my stuff on Android. I've been on an Android device for most of my life, um, but with some of these more recent updates to the Apple ecosystem, I moved over to there. So it's kind of like I'm going to be coming back to Android. But, um, you know, I, I have uh, experience with Sky Safari 6, and I'm going to be checking out what the differences are between Sky Safari 6 and Sky Safari 7. So for those of you who are already on Sky Safari 6, um, you can kind of consider this as maybe it's a good time to upgrade because I think there's a lot of really cool stuff um, that you're going to enjoy. So let's switch over um, to the tablet now, and you will see uh, that on the tablet, we've got uh, a nice kind of very simplified bar here at the bottom. Let me just kind of go back. Uh... Okay, I'm gonna revert this back to factory defaults so that you see it as you would see it when you download the software. So um, as you can see here, you've got all of the constellations pulled up. And you've got the planets as well as a number of bright stars that are already labeled for you. And um, I highly recommend that you kind of take your time here and learn the software. If you're new to this, um, having a, a good understanding of the night sky through just a number of, you know, very bright stars can be extremely helpful in your learning process to learn astronomy. Now, um, as we move into the menu system here, you will see that there is um, a number of options that are kind of new to Sky Safari 7. Um, we've got one sky, and what one sky is going to do um, is it's going to see what other people are interested in. And you can see like this little multiple people icon here at the bottom left hand part of your screen. And those multiple people icon is basically showing you this is a social way to learn astronomy. So you're gonna be seeing what do other people like about this software, what's interesting to them. And um, with that, I click on it and it will give you the opportunity to go to the most popular item and it will actually zoom in on it. Now it's pretty uh, midday on Sunday. So um, there's not a whole lot of people on this right now, uh, but it, you know, Venus is something else that someone is looking at. They're also set up on one sky. And you can learn about this. You can learn about Venus. All sorts of information are provided. Uh, if you had a telescope connected to this, you can, in fact, control your telescope with the Sky Safari Pro and Plus uh, versions. Right now, um, on Android, we have Sky Safari Pro out. Uh, Plus is not yet out. Um, but uh, if you're on iOS device, you've got uh, your options between Pro and Plus. Um, both of them are capable of telescope control. Now, um, if we go to center next, it will bring us to our next object. Now, right now, uh, as I was saying, there's not a lot of people on um, because it's midday, but we could go through if there were more people on here and we could check out what they're observing as well. And it's a really nice way to kind of learn astronomy um, and see what other people are interested in 
on a particular night. So let's go back out of uh, our. So let's go back out of our uh, one sky and turn that off. And we're going to go now into sky cast. Now with sky cast, it says begin sky casting. Um, and as it says here, Skycast allows you to guide a friend around in the night sky through their own copy of Star Sky Safari 7. Simply share your Skycast link with them to begin. So if you are located in one location, or um, even if you're standing right next to someone and you want to allow them to use their own device to learn the sky, you can Skycast uh, to them. And here I'll begin Skycasting. And it'll give me an option of how I want to share this with them. Um, so it says a nearby share, a quick share, in share instantly with people. Um, and that is just to give a little uh, quick way for them to find it. You can message them via email. You can make a calendar link. You can send it via Bluetooth. So if I click nearby share, for example, um, I can uh, use my device and I can share that on with them with the nearby share options like Bluetooth, okay? Uh, and with this now, you'll notice I actually have both the One Sky and I have Skycast on at the same time simultaneously here. So it looks like I was unsuccessful in turning that off. Connecting to other observers, there we go. So I have both of them turned on at once. Um, I've got two people now looking at the Whirlpool Galaxy, so there's that. And once again, you can learn more by clicking the little I for information. Let's turn off Skycasting. Skycasting off. One sky off. And those icons now disappear. I can share a link. Um, once again, I can complete an action in many, many different ways. I can share a link to uh, what it is I'm looking at in the sky. And there are all sorts of settings here. Now, um, some other things as we jump into this, let's talk a little bit more about our observing opportunities, how we can maybe uh, learn about what's going to be happening tonight in our sky. So let's take a look at the Tonight tab. Um, now, if you're on uh, an uh, if you're on an Android device um, that is a phone, you might not have quite all of these down bottom here. So um, you can rotate it landscape mode, and you'll see more. Um, if you go to the vertical mode, the portrait mode, you're going to have less options down here. So just be aware if you're not seeing all of these, they are available in the landscape mode more often. And I'll show you in a moment how to get to the menu items as well. So tonight, it gives you the dawn, uh, dusk, sunset, sunrise, all that stuff right here. It gives you the phase of moon. It gives you this rise and set time of the moon. Um, and it gives you a number of events. So we've got uh, all of these different events. We've got our solar system objects listed here as well. We've got our deep sky objects listed here. So if there's anything that you want to see, um, you can simply click on that object. So let's say, for example, that we want to view, um, let's see, a night deep sky object. Um, let's go with Andromeda Galaxy, which is one of my favorites. And if you see now, you're given an opportunity to um, see when does the, it rise. Notice it's in the 24 hour clock. So 204457. Um, that would be about eight o'clock um, p.m. And you got all of the options here, all the opportunity to see and view this. Uh, if I click center, it will turn to face the Andromeda galaxy. Now you'll notice this is actually daytime. I've got the sun in the sky here, um, which is kind of a problem. Um, if I go to time, I can adjust that and determine is this something, click on the hours here. And you'll notice that tonight actually it sets. If I keep going, 
it will rise again, as indicated, right here in the northeast, just around eight, a little bit after eight o'clock. Okay, now viewing time for this, this is not the ideal time of year to see the Andromeda galaxy, um, but it is visible uh, in the sky. You just got to keep in mind, the higher this object is in the sky, the more easily it is viewed. So you're going to be up till, you know, 2 or 3 a.m. in order to see the Andromeda galaxy this time of year. But it is visible if you stay up late enough. If I go back to the tonight and we scroll down, let's say we wanted to see the moon. So I click on the moon. It gives me a lot of information about the moon. Tons of information about the moon. Gives me all sorts of information here. I can click center on it. It will find the moon at a particular time of day. If I want to go to now, I can click now, and it will take me to the time and date that we are currently at. Now, once again, it's daytime right now. If you wanted to see tonight, just simply click on the hour symbol and then click forward until the sun sets. So the moon is in a waning gibbous phase and it's going to be rising right here right around one o'clock in the morning for me right now. And so if you wanted to view the moon right now, the best bet is to view it right before sunrise. And you'll see um, that during sunrise, the moon will have its left hand side illuminated. This is actually one of the best times of the lunar phase to look at the moon. When it's half illuminated like this, we can see uh, a lot of shadows that are cast across the craters. The light is coming in at about 90 degrees. And because we're going to have those bumps um, from the craters and mountains on the moon, it's going to hit the one side of that mountain or crater rim, and it's going to cast a very long shadow, which will allow you to view it more easily through a telescope or binoculars. So I highly recommend going out to view the moon um, during uh, that phase because it's one of the best. Moving on, um, let's take a look at the options under search. So under search, you'll once again see tonight's best. You'll also see the history um, of what we've already viewed. You'll have options for sun and planets, moons. You can even look at satellites. So if you want to find uh, a particular satellite, for example, we've got all these Starlink satellites. I know how popular they are for our astronomers out there, especially our astrophotographers who get all upset about these Starlinks because they mess up their images. Lots of Starlink satellites um, are there. Now, if you wanted to uh, try to search for something, you can search for, let's say, ISS, the International Space Station, ISS. There it is. And we can say center. Now, for us right now, the ISS is below the horizon. If you were to get an ISS pass, uh, you can actually have on the notifications that it will notify you that one of these ISS passes is going to occur, as well as many other uh, things like occultations, um, transits, and all sorts of other things that are happening throughout the solar system that are of interest. So, you know, I would suggest keeping on your notifications so that you can see what's going on in the night sky. In your settings, if you go to turn on the constellations. I highly recommend that you turn on the names, okay? And that way, when you're looking at constellations here in the sky, you can actually see what their names are. It's very helpful, and it allows you to learn these as you go. If you wanna learn more about the constellations, you can search for them, and you can learn all about those constellations as well. So all of that information is available here in the information pane. Easiest way to find them, once again, is through the search and enter the object's name. We've also got the ability to fly to things. So if we go back to the moon again and we click orbit, it will actually take us up off of planet Earth and we can fly to the moon. So that's a pretty neat feature. You can look at the moon from different sides. Back, way in the back here, you can see the Earth, and you can zoom in, and you can learn all about uh, the moon. 
get some detailed information on particular craters. And my favorite is when you're at the moon, let's go back to home again by clicking that little globe icon. It's going to bring us back to the Earth. And let's find the moon in the sky. And let's zoom in on the moon. I like when I'm looking at the moon through a telescope to be able to figure out what is, it, what is it exactly that I'm looking at. Now, keep in mind when you're looking through a telescope that the image will be inverted and flipped, um, which means that you need to be careful that you're actually looking at the thing in the telescope that you're seeing here on your screen because it is going to be inversed. Uh, but if you were to see a crater and you wanted to know what its name was, we could simply come in here and you can click on it then. See if I can get that crater, there it is, that's Kepler. And I can now view some information about that crater. Go another one. All right, and I can view some information on that. So it's very helpful to be able to, you know, be observing, have this out with you during your observations. Um, if you're gonna be doing that, I highly recommend you go over here to the night vision mode. And that will set you up with a red um, version of your screen. And that red version of the screen is to keep your dark adaption ability, which means that your eye is going to be more sensitive to what you're looking at through the telescope. So in your eye, you have both rods and cones. These are the sensors that your eye have in your retina that allow the signal to be passed to your brain. The rods are what you able, are able to see in black and white. And um, those there are many millions of. There are a lot more sensitive to uh, low light levels. So if you're looking around in the dark, you're going to be uh, using your rods more than your cones. The cones, on the other hand, they're more centrally located uh, in your eye. And there are many less of them. And they are a lot less sensitive during low light conditions. So if you're using a telescope, you're going to be relying on your rods, which means you can use your peripheral vision. So don't look directly into the eyepiece, kind of look sideways a little bit. Um, so don't look directly at the thing you're observing. And you'll actually see it become more bright. Now, if you're looking at the moon, this isn't going to be such a big deal. But if you're looking at a very, you know, deep uh, object, very very wispy nebula or something that it's very hard to see exactly what you're looking at uh, because it's so faint. Just look a little bit off to the side. Adverted vision is what that's called. And that will allow you to uh, kind of bring out more intensity uh, or more sensitivity in your eyes. And it's very helpful. So check out uh, these wispy objects with adverted vision. Planets and the moon, you can look directly at, and it, there's plenty of light to work with, so it's not such a big deal. Coming back to the app, one of the things I wanna show you here in the settings, once again, deep sky objects. Uh, I highly recommend that you check off show in wide fields. Um, what that will allow you to do is now you'll see I'm zoomed out completely, but yet I can see all of these objects that are deep sky objects. Let me go back with that turned off again. And you'll notice that when I have it turned off, you can't see those deep sky objects until you zoom in. And once you zoom in, now all of a sudden they're showing up. OK, but as soon as I zoom out, they start to disappear. And that makes it really difficult if you don't know where these objects are in the first place. So my suggestion is, is to click on the show in wide fields button. And that will make sure that you are able to see them from the wider view here. Um, if there's too much information, you can come in here, you can go to your settings, and you can click on best known only. And that then will simplify that menu quite a bit and allow you to see things um, in a way that's more digestible. But, um, you know, that's going to be based upon your your ability to 
deal with lots of information. And less is more usually on this. So I highly recommend maybe just going, if you're a beginner, to this best known only, and that will keep things simplified. Um, if you're more advanced and you'd like to learn more, but uh, still want it more simplified, click on the deep sky magnitude limit. And now you can determine the amount of objects based on the magnitude. Now remember, a sixth magnitude is what you can see with your eyes. So the magnitude scale, remember, the higher the number, the dimmer the object. So um, if it's the very dimmest star that you're going to be able to see, that's a sixth magnitude star, the visual limit of your eyes. Now, if you put a telescope or binoculars on that, that's gonna get a lot better. But um, as you go down towards a first magnitude star, for example, it is much, much brighter. And so um, this is something that you wanna consider when you're observing. If you are in a light polluted location, by the way, you probably will not see the more dim stars. And I highly recommend that you limit the intensity of your sky as a, as a factor here. If you're in a deep sky, if you're in a dark sky, I should say environment, you can turn this back to a higher number. But if you're in a light polluted city environment, you might wanna pull back on that so that you don't have more information than you need. So I'm gonna keep it to sixth magnitude here, and that's gonna help me to make sure that I'm not seeing things that are not in my sky um, because I am in a light polluted location. This is the magnitude limit of your, of your eyes. Once again, if you're dealing with a telescope, you might get options that are higher depending on your telescope. But just for our purposes, we'll assume that you are um, just using your eyes and we'll limit to sixth magnitude, and that will cover all your bases um, even in the darkest sky locations. Now you can also limit by object type selection here. So if we wanna look at just, now scope settings, once again, you can connect to a telescope and control the telescope. I'm not with my telescope right now, so it's not going to connect to a real telescope, but this is um, a virtual telescope, which will allow us to describe what it is exactly um, this does. So let's say, for example, uh, that we wanted to view, let's go to later tonight. Get past nighttime, okay. And okay, Cygnus the Swan is one of my favorite constellations. And in Cygnus, we've got this very last star called Albireo. If we click on Albireo, Albireo is actually two different stars. One of them is kind of a bluish color, you'll notice, and one of them is a more yellowish color. And when we're dealing with two stars of different colors, we're actually dealing with two stars of different temperatures. And so this blue star is much hotter than the yellow star is. Now, if we wanna to go to that and we have our telescope connected, we simply click go to it. Now, um, it says the scope can't slew to the target coordinates because they're below the horizon. Um, that's because it's not currently that time. Um, but if it were that time of day, we would be able to move to this object. So I'm gonna click back to now just to kind of show you that. Um, let's say we wanted to view uh, Venus, which by the way, you can view Venus in the daytime. So if you're safe about it and it's far enough away from the sun, um, I highly recommend you know checking out Venus even during the daytime. You can see it's different phases. All right, so if I go on Venus and I click on Venus here, I can click information and then I can click go to. And you'll notice that my telescope reticle is now shown going to Venus. And all right, let's next take a look at the calendar functions here in Sky Safari. So if I go to the calendar, you'll notice that I've got uh, all sorts of events that are gonna be happening by date. And they are all listed here as well. And you can actually view these in advance. So if you wanted to see, uh, the crescent moon meets Mars on July 21st, 2022, you can click view and it will show you what that will look like uh, on that particular date and time. 
So this is actually in the future for me at about 5 a.m. And this is kind of helpful if you're trying to do observations and you, you know, want to keep up to date and see things that are in the future for you. Uh, we've got bright July planetary nebula all night. You can click on that. You can view it. And that is the Dumbbell Nebula. Once again, it's in the future, July 27th at 10 p.m. You can learn all about it. You can also view some more information about it right here within the calendar. So it, it gives you all sorts of information up front, and you can explore more on your own. And I personally find this to be one of the most powerful features because for new people to astronomy to know what to look for is, you know, always a challenge. So even myself with 15 years of experience, I find that using the software as an aid, as a way to help myself to learn more um, is extremely helpful. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is the observe menu. Under the observe menu, you have a bunch of different options. And those options are an events finder, a planner, observing lists, observations, observing sessions, observing sites, a scope display, and uh, the my equipment. If you hear my son screaming above, that's uh, my four year old. Let's go to the events finder. And under the events finder, you'll have the ability to search for things that are happening at a particular date. So we've got a start date. Um, that's today, July 17th, 2022. If we want to go to only tonight, I can select, you know, like just tonight. Um, let's say I'll be up till 11 p.m. So I'd say 2300 hours. And then I'm going to click back. And you'll notice now it's changed the end time or end date to today as well. So it gives me a list of everything I can see tonight. Um, that is in the events finder. We can also um, look farther into the future if you want to change that date as well. So end date here is about a week from now. Under the observed planner, you can have many different objects and object types to view. So if I wanted to view globular clusters or globular clusters, um, I could do that. Current location. If I wanted to change locations, I can go to any location or I can select one. I can even make my own observing sites and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, it gives you a bunch of things to look for and it's got your dates available. So let's say on a specific date range. So from now until the end of the month is when I wanna be able to view this. And now when I do my search, it has that parameter in there. And I have all selections, all constellations available, and I click search. And now I can see all of these different constellations that are available are going to be highlighted um, instead of being grayed out like these. So this is really helpful if you're trying to search um, for things of interest. Let's say you don't want globular clusters, or maybe you want to do multiple. Open clusters is cool with you too. You also want to do planetary nebulas and galaxies. Planets are good. Okay. Um, and now you want to search. The search options here now will get you even more things to look at. And once again, anything that is highlighted is available, and anything that is grayed out is not available. And you'll see that the objects found now is over 10,000. So I highly recommend you be a little bit more, um, you know, refined in what you're looking for. So if I want to look just for galaxies during that range, um, it'll help me to narrow down um, exactly what it is I'm looking for. So this is really helpful um, for those of you who are, you know, just starting out and want to know what to look for. Or for those of you who are advanced and are just trying to, you know, break up the monotony of all the things you've already uh, seen before. So uh, under the observe menu, go back to it, observing lists. Okay, you can create a list of things that you want to observe. And um, it's just like it sounds. So if I want to come in here and I want to say, okay, uh, I want to make a list of all of the galaxies 
that I want to view. Okay, add an object now. So I want to go in here and I want to do uh, the Messier objects and I want to find a galaxy that I'm interested in. Let's say it's Andromeda Galaxy and add to list. And now I've got the Andromeda Galaxy as one of my things in my galaxy list to observe. And you can do this with all different types of objects. You can make one list, you can make a bunch of different lists, you can make a list for each person in uh, your family and you can do this together as a family. It's all sorts of opportunities that you have available to you. All right, now under the uh, observing tab, you also have observations themselves and you can say uh, create an observation. So let's say you found the Andromeda galaxy and there it is. Okay, I've made my observation. I can create an observation with the Andromeda galaxy here and you can add all sorts of information. You can add in comments. You can describe what it is you saw. You can say what telescope you were using. Um, you can tell me what date it was on, what time it was on. You can add it to an observing list. So there's the observing list that I tackled. Um, I can create a session name. You can do all sorts of really cool things here uh, within that observation session tab. Observing sites. So let's say I want to create a new observing site. So I oftentimes go up um, to one of my favorite dark sky sites, which is Cherry Springs State Park in northwestern Pennsylvania. And this is actually an international dark sky preserve. So it's an area where the skies are about as dark as it gets here on the East Coast. Um, your naked eye objects are almost entirely available to you. Uh, the moisture content is a little bit more than out west, so you will have a little bit more of trouble um, than you would out in, let's say, Arizona, for example. But Cherry Springs is one of my favorite locations. Um, if you're in the area of the northeast, Pennsylvania is where I live, um, so it's pretty quick for me to get there. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're on the northeast to check out Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania. So I'm going to go into observing sites and I can create a new observation site and I'm going to go to from a list and here is Cherry Springs. I'm going to type it in. So now I can view from that location. OK, under the observe tab, the next thing I want to show you is how to go to a different location. So I have under the observe tab already made a observing site. So the Cherry Springs star party is now selected. Um, this is the information on the Cherry Springs site. I can also go into menu and I can go to settings, location, and I can actually choose that from a list. So once again, Cherry Springs. Make sure I have a space here in the middle and search. And I'm going to then have my location now set up as Cherry Springs State Park. Now, the difference between myself and Cherry Springs State Park is not a whole lot on the actual Earth, so my observations are not gonna be that far off, uh, but it's nice that you can change your location, especially if you're traveling a far distance. All right, next I'd like to show you how to set up some of your own equipment. So if you wanna add your equipment to Sky Safari 7, you can. So all you need to do is come down here where it says observe, click on my equipment, and now you can add things like telescopes, eyepieces, binoculars and finders, cameras, barlows and focal reducers. So let's add a telescope. Let's go with a Celestron. And let's go with the Next Star Evolution 8. Here it is. And you can say add to my equipment. And let's say we go to eyepieces now, and they have it listed by manufacturer. So once again, we've got all sorts of different Celestron eyepieces here. Let's go with a Illuminos uh, 31 millimeter. We'll go with a wide field eyepiece to get started. Um, now, when I come back into here and I go to my scope display, I can add a bunch of things in. I can include a Telrad, by the way, which is super helpful. 
and I can create my own fields of view. So I can say from my equipment. So I've got my Nexstar Evolution 8 with my Luminos 31 eyepiece. Okay, so now we've got the Nexstar Evolution 8 and I can even choose the indicator color. So I want red, let's say. And that way I can see my telescope in my equipment list. And there it is. So I'm going to turn off the custom fields of view. I'm going to turn on my Celestron Next Star Evolution. And now when I look at my location here on Venus, I've got my Telrad on there already. Let's turn off the Telrad briefly. And the crosshairs. And there it is. That's the field of view that I would be seeing it at. Now you can see this is kind of too big, right? Venus doesn't really look like anything in particular. So we'll come back to our observations list. We'll go back to my equipment. We'll add in another eyepiece. This time let's add in our Celestron Luminos 10. Add to the equipment. We can go back to my, my observations and scope display and Instead of using um, the wider field eyepiece, once again, adding from equipment, we'll go with the 10 millimeter eyepiece, which will give us additional range. And we'll make that a blue, uh, blue indicator. And now we can have both of them on. And you can see that I can now see it more zoomed in and so on. So this is really powerful. It allows you to make observations both in the present as well as in the future. And it gives you the opportunity to see what it is you're going to see through the telescope, plan ahead, have the right equipment in advance, ready to go. And that way you're not wasting time out under the night sky especially if you are new to this hobby, the last thing you would like to have happen is that you're out, it's a beautiful night, and you cannot make the most of it because of problems just in terms of planning and setup. So the more you can kind of plan ahead, the more enjoyable the night will be for you. And for those of you who are already advanced, this is even more powerful because you can learn more, you can plan ahead and even the most advanced observers will benefit here. Okay, another powerful tool in Sky Safari 7 is the ability to see when our deep sky objects are going to rise and set. Okay, let's say I want to figure out how Andromeda is going to move throughout the day. Um, I can come in down here to selection and I can click on graph object and it will show me Messier 31 Andromeda Galaxy compared to both the moon and sun. We've got our nighttime, and we've got our daytime. So you can see that, let's turn off everything but Andromeda. You can see Andromeda is rising higher into the sky at different times of night. This would be your um, altitude. So zero is the horizon, 90 is directly over your head. So the higher that this line is on this graph, the better. So viewing time here is best in the morning hours of that timing right now on July 2022 or July any of any year for that matter. All right, everybody, thanks a lot. I think that this video is done. Um, we've talked about so many different things and it's way longer than I had planned this video to be. So, you know, if you like this video, please uh, help out me with the channel, hit the subscribe button, ring the notification bell. It really does help me out. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to get back to you. So I'm going to get going here. I, I wish you great observations and clear skies. Um, keep looking up, everybody. The universe is closer than you think. See ya.